Okay, good morning, everybody. And thank you so much for joining our class today. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida IFAS Extension Service here in Hernando County. And today we're gonna to be talking a little bit about growing vegetables in containers. So this is just a very, you know, fairly brief class today, but a lot of what I touch on, we kind of touch on when we do classes on vegetable gardening, we've done in-person and online classes recently on putting together a spring vegetable garden. So we talk a little bit about growing containers there. We also have a class on growing herbs coming up. And a lot of this information on growing vegetables in containers works just as well for growing herbs in containers also. So if you don't want to have an in-ground garden that requires shovels and crawling around your hands and knees and pulling weeds out of the ground, that's fine. You can grow plenty of stuff in containers. So let me go ahead and open up my PowerPoint and kind of put myself down in the corner there. So like I said, we're talking about growing vegetables in containers. But first I wanted to point out that if you wanna follow all of our classes and find out everything we have going on and coming up, just go to www.hernandoextensionalloneword.com and that is a freestanding landing page where you can check out all of our upcoming classes that we have organized and scheduled and all the details for. So if you bookmark that and check it frequently, you won't miss anything that we have going on. But if you're busy and you have to miss it, that's okay. It pretty much all gets recorded nowadays. So if you're not available when we're doing it, you can watch it later that day, the next day, whenever you'd like to, whenever works well for you. Now, real quickly, just want to cover a couple of real quick slides here. And this is for Hernando County residents. And this is something that we haven't touched on for a while. Hernando County has a fertilizer ordinance. If you're watching from another county, your county probably has a fertilizer, fertilizer ordinance, but I'm not sure. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. And I have no idea what the details of yours are. But here in Hernando County, we have a fertilizer ordinance. And the reason why they created that is now the state says counties that have a lot of springs or a basin management action plan have to have some kind of fertilizer ordinance. We have a lot of natural springs here on the west coast of Florida, Hernando County and all the counties above and below us. They have been getting way too much nitrogen in them. So they came up with a plan to help reduce the amount of nitrogen in it and created fertilizer ordinance. So some of the general rules in our fertilizer ordinances, you cannot fertilize your lawn when a hurricane or tropical storm is coming. And that kind of makes sense. If you put down your fertilizer and you get 10 inches of rain all of a sudden, your fertilizer is all gonna wash away. You just wasted your time and your money and we don't want you to do that. You're not allowed to fertilize within 10 feet of the edge of any spring, pond, stream, lake, canal, or wetland. That makes sense too. You don't wanna be getting that fertilizer you wanna put on your lawn into the water because it's just gonna harm the aquatic uh, environment then. The most important rule for homeowners here in Hernando County is you cannot fertilize your lawn between January 1st and March 31st. So you can't fertilize your lawn legally until April 1st, April Fool's Day. So you're gonna to have to wait a few more weeks, but that's okay. Your lawn can wait, it's not gonna die. It's not gonna go anywhere for not being fertilized right away. Professionals have slightly different rules. They all, starting a number of years ago, had to get a um, commercial fertilizer applicator certificate, Extension does the training for them to teach them how to fertilize properly. And all those people, the professionals have to register with Hernando County. They had to back in 2014 and they still have to right now. So we always suggest getting a soil test done first. That's the best way to figure out what your soil pH is. Um, it tells you how much of what kind of fertilizer you should put down tells you if you need to apply lime or not. If you have very high pH, you don't want to put down lime because it's only going to make it higher and may cause lots and lots of problems. So soil test first, lime second if you need to, and fertilizer after that. But here, not until April 1st. So 
we wanted to kind of cover that really quickly. So um, I think StreamYard shrinks and rearranges my slides for me a little bit. That's very, very nice of them to do that, but sometimes annoying. So like I said, we're going to be talking about growing vegetables in containers today. So we're going to talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages of not growing in the dirt or in the ground in the native soil outside in your backyard or front yard or wherever it is. We're going to talk about some different options for different types of containers, how to get started growing in containers, and then some hints for success with different vegetables, especially for people who are new to gardening in Florida, because timing is everything here if you want to be successful. Here's a nice picture I found of a traditional Florida vegetable garden. And you know, my garden has never looked that good. But kind of a traditional garden is going to be something that's in the ground. It's a big square or rectangle, uh, probably has a trellis on one end or another for cucumbers and things that like to climb. Everything is fully planted out. It's full. It looks great. Man, that is really hard to accomplish here in Florida. You can grow plenty in the ground. But I don't see any hint of insect damage or disease or anything else going on in this picture. Those are all cucumbers up in the front. They all look perfectly healthy. That's really, that's just really difficult to accomplish here in Florida. So what kind of things could be hiding in your soil? What are some of the reasons why maybe you don't want to garden in the soil in your yard? You may have um, plant pathogenic uh, nematodes. Nematodes are microscopic worms that live in the soil. They are not that lower picture. Those are beetle grubs. But you see the upper picture, those are roots from probably a tomato plant. And the plant grew, it got done. The person who took this picture pulled the tomato plant up out of the ground. And you can see the, roll, the roots are all swollen they have great big bumps on them what that is is root knot nematodes and these are nematodes that feed on the roots of all hundreds of different species of plants and they damage the roots they make them swell they make them bumpy and now the roots can't take up water or nutrients as well as they should and the plants suffer die prematurely don't produce nearly as well. So nematodes can be a problem that you encounter in the soil outside. Um, different bacteria and fungi, all the different um, uh, leaf spot fungal diseases generally exist in the soil. A lot of those diseases are in the soil. When you plant your garden in the soil and it rains really hard and the dirt splashes up on the leaves, Boom, a lot of 99% of the time, that's how your plants are going to catch some kind of disease. So growing things in containers in non-contaminated soil can help with reducing the uh, incidence of diseases. Here in Florida, we have mostly sand. Not everybody, I'm sure somebody watching today has something other than sand. Maybe they have clay. Maybe they, um, if anybody's watching from South Florida, you have something called marl down there that's limestone and a weird uh, unusual sticky clay so we all have different types of soil but very few of us have a lot of organic matter in our soil out in the midwest in iowa illinois indiana ohio they have 14 15 percent organic matter in your soil out there here in florida we have maybe one percent organic matter in our soil so this helps when it rains a lot because the rain and the water drains very quickly, but it's not really good for plant growth. So if you are growing your vegetables in the ground, you're going to have to either purchase or make some type of compost to add to the soil to build it up. But if you're growing in containers, and we're going to get to this, if you just buy high quality potting soil, that helps to take care of that problem. And our soils have a very low water holding capacity because they're so sandy and drain so quickly and freely. Uh, potting soil is kind of designed to be the ideal. It's gonna hold water for the right amount of time, but it's gonna drain pretty well also so your potted plants aren't sitting there in mud dying because you don't want your plants to be too wet 
don't want them to be too dry. With potting soil, you can get kind of close to the ideal in between where you should be at. So some advantages of leaving the garden behind, the in-ground garden, those nematodes can be totally avoided. So if you grow your plants in containers and you use a clean potting soil, and you can buy that by a small bag, big bag, dump truck load, whatever it might be, depending on if you're filling up one pot or a lot of pots, if it's clean potting media, it won't have nematodes in it. Uh, you can, it's much easier to control the drainage, the soil structure, the pH, the fertility. Uh, you can The fertilizers that you add to a container generally stay within the container. And it's a lot easier to maintain physically than a large in-ground garden. A lot of people might have physical limitations, not easy for them to get you know, down on their hands and knees, up and down, pulling weeds, picking beans or pulling radishes, whatever it might be. If you can handle that, it's excellent exercise. And especially during nice time of year, great way to get out there and get some fresh air, sunshine. There's just a huge number of different health benefits from gardening and vegetable gardening adds the nutrition benefits on top of the health benefits. So it's great. But a lot of people just aren't able to do the crawling around on their hands and knees, maintaining a really traditional kind of garden. So there's a lot of ways around that, a lot of different things that you could do. You can build a raised bed garden, and these can be built out of a number of different materials. You see the one on the left-hand side here it has either PVC or metal rods up on the top. So on top of that, you could put shade cloth to help keep it a little bit cooler and shadier in there. You could put insect netting so those plants, when they're small and just starting to grow, you can cover them with netting to keep the insect pests out. You could start your garden earlier because if you're going to still get maybe a frost or a freeze, you can cover that kind of raised bed with plastic or sheets or whatever you might be using to help keep it warm and protected. So that raised bed is very, very helpful. The one in the center picture here is a little bit more um, commonly used. This is just lumber. And the trick is you want to purchase quality potting media or potting soil to fill that with. You don't want to build a raised bed garden and then just go and dig the native soil out of your yard and put it in there because it's going to be filled with potentially uh, diseases, fungal spores, nematodes, everything else. You're just, you're not avoiding problems. You're just moving them. And if you look online, there's a lot of different um, plans and diagrams and directions for building accessible gardens for either yourself or a family member that may need a little bit of extra assistance. The picture on the right here is a raised bed that's actually built up in a box. And if you look very closely, it has wheels on the bottom, so it can be moved. And if you build it at the correct height, somebody who's in a wheelchair can actually roll up along the edge and help take care of that garden. So no matter what situation you're in, physical health wise, there's some way around it so that you can garden and at least grow a little bit of something. So some ideas on materials that you could use for raised beds. You can use untreated wood, just raw pine or uh, untreated wood. The problem is that outdoors in the environment, especially it's on the ground, getting wet, getting rained on, has soil up against the side and the bottom, it's gonna rot eventually. Anything that's made of wood outside is not gonna last forever. You could use treated woods because they're not treated with arsenic and the same things that they used to treat lumber with many years ago, it's not soaked with creosote like uh, telephone poles are in this day and age. So it's much safer to use. If you're not comfortable with treated wood, you could use stone, you could use bricks. Concrete blocks or cinder blocks work very, very well. And if you turn them with the whole side up on the top cinder block, you can fill that with soil and put individual plants in it. Uh, you can make it out of bamboo. There are plans online for using hay bales. So you put bales of hay around, you put the potting soil or potting media in it, 
and the hay is going to break down eventually and that just kind of turns into compost and gets added so there's a lot of different ways that you can go about doing this a lot of really good ideas out there for containers there's a lot of different types of containers if you go to a big box store now you can find every size shape color everything else imaginable you can match the color and the shape with um how you're designing your garden or your outdoor space if you have a patio a pool a pool lanai you know paved area whatever it might be you can get a uh, matching pots that are the same color the same shape maybe different sizes if you're craftier than i am you can actually um kind of have it really add to your outdoor um living experience you can still buy clay pots good old-fashioned clay pots and you can get plastic pots something you have to remember is clay pots can actually breathe so the clay over time the moisture is going to leave the inside of the pot quicker and the soil is going to dry out faster because the clay can breathe to a certain extent. Plastic does not breathe. Plastic pots, if you buy one, you have to double check, look inside and make sure that there are drainage holes. Sometimes you'll buy pots that just don't have drainage holes. You're going to have to drill one. Other times they have holes, but you just have to pop out the piece of plastic. It's already kind of cut for you. You need to get a hammer and a screwdriver and bang it out. But your containers have to have some kind of drainage. Otherwise, you're growing your plants in a pot. And when, if it gets really, really, really wet, your plants are growing basically in mud now. And that works fine for rice, works okay for celery. Anything else is gonna drown. It's gonna get some kind of root rot and the plant is gonna drown and die pretty quickly. So watch for drainage. Keep an extra close eye on clay because clay pots can look very attractive. They weather very nicely. It looks very um, historic, I think. But it's the, pot, the, the soil inside the pot is going to dry out a little bit faster, so you need to keep a close eye on it. So what kind of soil are you going to use in your containers? We just recommend getting a quality potting soil. So what that means is probably not the cheapest. Or if you go to the store and they have stuff, I don't even know if you can get it for 99 cents a bag, but just the cheapest stuff they have, pick up a bag. If the bag is really heavy, that means it's really wet and it might be kind of skunky. So try to get a sniff of the soil in the bag. If it smells ooh, really stinky, probably not really good. It's probably just been basically wet and muddy in the bag and it's gone anaerobic. It has anaerobic bacteria breaking down the materials inside of it, which isn't necessarily a danger to plants, but it's it's just not the best product. It's not going to work out really well for growing healthy plants in. So you want to use a quality potting soil. Uh, it should be soilless. So what that means is if you dig a hole in your backyard and take that stuff, that's soil. Other components that go into potting soil, things like perlite, peat or peat moss or bark or stuff like that is not considered soil. So therefore, potting soil is technically soil less. Gets a little confusing there. But some of the materials that they're gonna put in potting soil are designed to absorb and retain moisture. So when you water it, it's gonna soak the water up really well and get good and wet very easily the water's not going to like run off like maybe you've noticed it can do out in your yard you go out there and things are really dry start watering your bush and it seems like the water's just running off it's not going down to the roots it runs off it does that so good potting soil the water is going to soak in you're going to have good drainage so the excess water is going to drain out with containers you want to thoroughly water them until the water drains out then leave them alone, let them com pretty completely dry out, and then water them really well again. The biggest problem we've ever seen with houseplants is people overwater them. They go in there and they have a houseplant and they give it a little bit of water each day, 
a little more, a little more, a little more, a little more. And it never has a chance to dry out. The roots stay too wet and the plant dies from some kind of root rot problem. So quality potting soil, water really well, make sure the water is able to drain out and let it drain out. Now, if you get really large containers that you want to put a larger plant in, tomatoes, watermelons, squash, maybe even a dwarf citrus tree or mango or something like that, you can get big containers to put a small tree in. You can put some filler basically in the very bottom. You don't have to fill it with soil top to bottom. Um, I've used a big, big piece pine bark to fill in a couple inches of the bottom, then the soil goes on top of that. The pine bark is gonna break down over time and the pine bark is lighter. So if you ever have to move that pot, rule number one is big pots full of dirt are very, very heavy. And if you're planning on moving these things around, they're very, very heavy. You don't wanna get hurt. Some pine bark in the bottom is gonna help, you know, reduce the weight, make it a little bit easier or more possible to move it. And pine bark is cheaper than quality potting soil as a general rule. So you have to have plenty of soil in your pot for things to grow and the roots to spread. But some filler in the form, of, like I said, I've used pine bark. You could use other kind of wood chip mulch for filler in the bottom, but you can do that and it helps to take up a little space. It's just gonna break down over time and eventually become soil. So if you're growing things in containers, a couple things you need to keep in mind. Some people do use mulch on the plants in the container, and that's fine. If you're growing vegetables or any kind of annuals with small stems, you don't want to use wood chips because wood chips can damage small, delicate stems. Um, like I said, big planters full of soil can get very heavy. So when you put them where they're going to stay long term, basically, fill them up with the soil, put the plants in them, swap out the plants as you need to, but plan on keeping the pot and the container pretty much in the same spot. You're gonna to have to remember drainage because if you look at this picture here, somebody watered their plant and then the water runs out. And if it gets on a sidewalk, it's gonna grow algae. It might get slippery. It's gonna look unsightly. And that could be a problem. You could put smaller pots on top of a saucer, which helps to catch the water so it doesn't just come out and go all over the place. So keep these things in mind. You don't want to be um, creating a slip hazard or fall hazard or anything like that. So like I said earlier, if you're craftier than I am, because I'm not really good at arts or crafts, but if you are, your options are pretty much only limited by your imagination. So you can find um, other things to grow plants. And keep in mind, a container is something that can physically hold soil and has a way of draining. Because if it's a big thing of soil and absolutely no drainage, if it gets really wet, you're growing mud, basically. So you can put artistic things in your garden. You can get antiques. You can get like the... Um, it's a really cool picture here of a, a kid's dump truck toy with a couple little plants in it. You can put annuals, you can put cacti, you can put succulents, you can grow vegetables, you can grow herbs, flowers, and any combination of them also. You can mix colors and coordinate them. You could try to mix different shapes and forms. I don't do this because I'm terrible at arts and crafts. But if you have, you know, if you want to get creative, just give it a shot and see how it turns out. Um, almost all vegetables can be grown in some kind of container. The bigger the vegetable, the bigger the container you need. Um, and it's a good option if you live in an apartment, if you have access to growing something on a rooftop, a balcony, terraces, other small spaces. You want to be careful with that water so you don't make a slip hazard. Um, so like I said, you can use pretty much anything you have as long as it's big enough to provide enough room for the roots and has adequate drainage. That's all you really have to worry about. So we're gonna start going to a couple of questions here. Um, 
Lee, good morning. How are you? Alicia, good morning. How are you? Uh, Alicia has a question. Is pine bark treated or organic? So for growing organic vegetables. Pine bark mulch is almost always organic. I do not know of any chemicals or any reason why they would add chemicals to pine bark mulch. If you read the label, you may, you're probably going to have to flip the bag over. Read the label very carefully. If it's been treated with anything in particular, it should say on there that it has been. If it says absolutely nothing about being treated, it should be fine. The mulches that you buy that are colored, you know, the dyes, you can get red, black, probably a couple of other colors now too. I've been told that those are soy-based dyes that they use, but I'm not honestly positive what kind of dye they use. There should be information on the bag, but you probably want to avoid the colored mulches. They can be handy for like your front yard to add color and help to tie everything together in your front yard. But generally you have, you know, landscape plants, non-edibles out there. You may have edibles out in the landscape. So um, the dyed mulches aren't inherently dangerous, but I really can't say exactly what they use as far as dyes. But pine bark, generally what they do a pine bark, they harvest pine trees and they strip the bark off. They grind it or, or screen it depending on if they want to bag up big chunks, medium chunks, or little chunks. And then they bag it up and they sell it. And that's it. They're not going to put anything on it that costs some money that they're not going to do for a reason. And Alicia says, shouldn't pine bark be for flowers only, not veggies due to chemicals? It's not so much because of the chemicals. It's because of the stems. So most, pretty much all vegetables have a non-woody stem. So the stem is herbaceous and fairly delicate. Big chunks of pine bark banging up against the stem of a tomato plant or green pepper or um, green beans or whatever it might be is probably going to damage those stems. So that's why we say that you probably shouldn't use, you know, wood chips with vegetables. But pine bark, like I said, generally isn't going to have chemical issues. So here's some pictures for vegetables in containers. You can put them in hanging baskets. So, you know, obviously um, you can put a hook on the side of your house, hang a, hang a basket from it. If you have, um, you can get, what are they, shepherd's hooks, the poles, that you put in the ground and it has kind of a hook on the end for holding a hanging basket. Strawberries grow very well in hanging baskets. A lot of things do, even these pepper plants on the left, they grow erect, straight up and down. They'll grow in hanging baskets outdoors. It gives you more room. That way you're making use of your vertical space, not just the horizontal space on your property. But one thing you need to keep in mind is you need to match the size of the pot with the size of the vegetable plant you're trying to grow. So even as something as small as a one gallon pot, you can grow individual herbs. And we have a class coming up on growing herbs. And I, I mentioned growing them in containers. They're very easy to grow in containers and you could be very attractive also. But a little pot, you can grow individual herbs, individual lettuce plants, greens, lettuce and greens you grow during the winter. They're just about done now this time of year. Slightly larger pot, like three gallon, you can grow several lettuce plants, so, um, a dozen or so carrots, uh, more greens, you can plant several plants, green beans, cucumbers. If you want to grow something larger, like a tomato plant, pepper, squash, eggplant, cantaloupe, anything that becomes a physically larger plant, you're probably going to need five gallon or bigger. Bigger is fine. Giving the roots more room to grow in is just great. But unless you get a special uh, dwarf or miniature variety of tomato or pepper or eggplant, you're going to need 
a minimum five gallon pot to grow it in successfully. Otherwise, if the pot's too small, you're going to plant your you're going to plant your tomato, your pepper, and your eggplant. They're going to grow. They're going to look great, and then they kind of get stunted because they run out of room in the pot for the roots. And that usually happens before you end up with your vegetable harvest off of them. So you need to give them a big enough container to grow in for them to grow all the way to the point where they flower, fruit, and you get a harvest off of them. <clears throat> so talking about what kind of different things that you could grow in a container, all these different things, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, peas, onion, spinach, it's too late to plant them now because this class is being done live and it looks like today is March 6th. And it is a beautiful, sunny, wow, not a cloud in the sky, warm day outside. And it will be, it is spring basically now, and it will probably be summer very soon. Sometimes spring goes by very quickly. And then before you know it, it gets very hot and the heat sets in. These are all cool season crops. They, the best time to start them is October 1st, grow them all winter long. Here, if you have these things in your yard, in your garden right now, that's great. I have the last of my broccoli going. I didn't grow any snow peas this year. I have kale, which is still looking great, but it won't for much longer. Those things are just about done. And I'm starting thing. I just started some um, zucchini squash to grow in containers myself. So because we're moving from cool season to warm season stuff. So probably too late to start them now. These guys, and these all grow very, very well in containers if you're limited with space. Lettuce, radishes, carrots, all the different Asian greens, bok choy, Chinese cabbage, all those things. They grow great. It's probably too late to start them now. If you have them in your garden growing, you should hopefully still have time to finish them up, but you're going to run out of time really quick. Don't try growing these guys during like April, May, June, July, way, way, way too hot. They will get eaten up with insect pests. They will look terrible. They will taste terrible. They will die from fungal diseases. And if you, if I catch any of you putting pictures of them on Facebook gardening groups asking what's wrong with my broccoli plant and it's the middle of July, if I'm in a bad mood, I'm going to go on there and respond and tell you that that is the absolute worst possible time to grow it. You should know better. All of you are going to know better after this. So these things all grow great here, just not now because it's just unfortunately too late. But there's plenty of things that you can plant right now, today, this coming weekend, tomorrow, really, really soon. So now is the time to start transplants. That means that if you have transplants or if you go to the store and buy transplants and those are little vegetable plants that are already up and growing, now is the time to be putting them in the containers outside in the appropriate sunny spot and get them growing. So things like tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants, you should, if you're starting them from seed, you should have started the seeds one, two, three months ago, and you should have transplants now ready to put in the ground, not the ground, but in your container. Cucumbers, plant cucumber seeds in pots and in containers today. Melons, cantaloupe, watermelons, things like that, plant them in your containers today. Keep in mind, they all are vines. So when they come up, cantaloupes and watermelons, the plants are going to run all over the place. So you're going to have to keep that in mind and give them room. You could try to run them up a trellis. That's possible, but they're going to take a good amount of space. Any kind of bush beans, pole beans, summer squash, start those seeds today or next weekend or really, really soon. Because I have a funny feeling this spring is going to get really warm really fast. So that, and that can happen a lot of times. So I have some pictures that I took a few years ago of things that I was growing in containers because the house we lived in have flower beds outside with, and I mean, you can see on the right hand side here, a little box was a little, you know, dreary, unexciting landscape plants, but I have pots 
I had a couple bags of potting soil. So during the winter, I grew parsley and dill. And you can see, I think both of those are probably five gallon pots, a little hard to tell for sure. In a five gallon pot, you can grow a number of parsley plants and several dill plants, very important. Both of those you need to grow over the winter. They like the cool weather. Don't plant parsley and dill now. It's gonna be really, really unhappy when it gets hot, which is gonna happen really soon. But if you grow them during the winter, they'll grow just great in containers. I harvested a bunch of parsley. Dill, if you get only a few plants growing, the plants get, I don't know, three feet tall? And it doesn't take a lot of dill plants to give you a lot of dill to add to your cooking all winter long. And keep in mind, with both of them, you can cut them near the end of the season when they're almost done and dry them and grind them. And now you're creating your own dried herbs. And then next time you go to the store, go to the um, spice section, look at the price on dried herbs. They're not cheap. So great way to save money and you know where your dill came from and if you grow it yourself and dry it yourself it's probably going to taste better anyway other vegetables lettuce i grew lettuce in one of those little styrofoam coolers that they send um i can't remember the name of the company you can buy meat online and they ship it and they uh, omaha steaks i think and it comes in a little styrofoam cooler hey don't throw those away Recycle them, get creative, bang some holes in the bottom so it has drainage, fill it with soil. I grew lettuce in it. That's romaine growing in it, and it grew really, really well. It's really easy to manage the um, moisture to be able to water it, not too much, not too little. And if you use a uh, water soluble fertilizer, very easy to fertilize also. And green onions, I grew. Um, that looks like about a dozen onion plants in a five gallon pot. You could use the five gallon pots that you buy at the big box stores, Walmart, lots of other, you know, just a five gallon bucket that you might use for odds and ends around your house or washing your car with. If you have access to a lot of them, drill drainage holes in them, fill them with soil. It's five gallons. So it's big enough for a tomato plant, pepper plant eggplant, whatever it might be, it's going to work just fine. But you can grow smaller things like green onions in it. I did, and it worked really, really well. Carrots. Uh, you can see the picture on the left is the carrots growing in a five-gallon bucket. And pulled one up. They grew just fine. Potting soil is always very loose. And when you grow carrots or another root crop in it, when you want to pick them, you can, it's very easy to get your fingers down in the soil, kind of feel around, pull those carrots up without damaging them or breaking them. No nematode problems. A lot of times carrots, if you have a lot of nematodes in your in-ground garden, if the carrots, if you start them too early in the fall or you're trying to grow them too late in the very, very early spring, because carrots should be finishing now, they're going to get little bumps on them. They might get bumps or swollen root hairs. That's from nematodes. But because I grew it in a five gallon bucket with fresh potting soil in it and drainage holes, no nematodes, no problems. Have perfect looking carrots. So it worked very, very well for them. Celery. Celery is another one that's very easy to grow in pots. Celery is a little bit different. Celery likes it wet. So if, you, if you're the kind of person who just naturally overwaters their plants, try growing celery. It will like it. Celery likes a really moist, rich soil, but you can see how green it is and how well it grew. A little difficult if what you want is celery just like what you see at the grocery store with the very, very large ribs. You can grow it, but it's a slow grower. It grows for three or four months. And it's going to be hard to get it that large. So you can grow kind of baby celery. If you don't mind eating the leaves and greenery off the celery, you're going to get beautiful greenery on it. So great way to grow your own celery. 
And I think that's about all I have for the actual presentation there. If you guys have any follow-up questions, there is my email. There's our office address. There is our phone number. So please feel free to contact me. Um, if you have a question, best way to get a hold of me is by email. And email lots of pictures. I like to tell people there's no such thing as too many pictures. So send a bunch because it makes it a lot easier for us to get an idea of what your problem is, get a good look at it, and that way we can't give you any advice or recommendations until we know what's going on. So it's those pictures that tell us what's going on, and then we once we figure out what it is, we can tell you what to do to deal with it. So if anybody has any other questions and you're still watching live, just go ahead and put them in the comments. I've got the comments open here. Let me go ahead and pop out of my PowerPoint. And about 40 minutes. I show pretty good time management today. So any last minute questions, go ahead and ask. Otherwise, if you watch this video after the fact, go ahead and put any questions or comments in the um comment section on the post i try to keep going back and checking that over you know the next couple days as people are commenting and answering any questions you that you might have other than that um let me show one last time real quick hernandoextension.com the best way to find out everything that we have going on all of our upcoming classes days times whether we have registration or not whether there's a charge or not everything you need to know is right there so i see i have a comment here and we got a very good question here is there a printable list as what to grow and when yes there is university of florida has a lot of really really good information online so if you go to Google and you just Google UF or University of Florida, if you want to type out the log, but all you have to do is put in UF Vegetable Gardening Guide. University of Florida has a vegetable gardening guide that you can pull up online. You can pull up a PDF. You can print it for yourself. You can hold on to it. We have copies here at our office if anybody wants to stop by and pick up one. And it has a chart and a listing of all the different vegetables that you can grow based on where you live in Florida. So North Florida is different from Central Florida, which is different from South Florida. Most vegetables you can grow in all three, but you're gonna grow them at different times. So Basia, wherever you live, if you live up in the Panhandle, you're, you have a different calendar than we have in Hernando County. And our calendar is different from, um, somebody like lee who lives down in broward county we're all on different schedules so university of florida does have that um print out if you can't find it just shoot me an email and i'll go ahead and email you a link to that that's a really really great guide really good resource and every year that's the number one downloaded fact sheet that university of florida has that always takes number one spot and Katie, you are so very welcome. Katie's been planting in pots for years, as have I. I kind of mixed, sometimes I have a lot of pots going, sometimes very few. Um, my herbs are always basically in containers, but right now Katie has tomatoes and hot peppers planted. Yeah, they could both do really, really well in containers. Um, Dennis was not able to watch today, so can I be included to get a link to watch later? You are watching us on Facebook Live. So as soon as I get done rambling here and we finish it up, Facebook takes a few minutes to like cycle the video. After that, it's on our Facebook page and you can watch it whenever you'd like, either right away, later on tonight with dinner, later on tonight, if you can't fall asleep, listening to my voice might help with that, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, these are all done on Facebook. They're saved on Facebook Live. I'll probably take the video of this, send it to Hernando County, and they'll put it on the Hernando County Government 
YouTube channel. And I think I have um, a link for that also here. So this is a long link. If you go to YouTube, go to the little search box at the very top, put in Hernando County Government and search, and you'll go, Hernando County Government has a YouTube channel. If you go to the YouTube channel and look up the playlists, there's a playlist for extension, which are all my videos. There's a playlist for Florida Friendly Landscaping, which are Lily's videos, and she has 105 or more up there now on different Florida Friendly Landscape questions. You may also have a, a garden, an ornamental garden. You're trying to grow flowers in the shade. She has classes that cover all that. So it's a great resource. But thank you so much for wanting to, to watch us here on Facebook Live. And Lee loves the Florida uh, Gardening Guide. That's great. Like I said, it's the number one publication every year that they have. Barbara asks about earth boxes. Earth boxes work just great. Earth boxes can be a little expensive, but if you already have them, or if you inherited them, or somebody gave them to you, or you know, however you ran across them, they work really, really well. An earth box is basically a big pot that's shaped in a rectangle. Whole soil has drainage, so it fits the bill. Earth boxes are great. Um, same potting soil, yeah, you could use a quality potting soil in an earth box, and you don't have to throw away the old potting soil when your vegetables finish and you want to put more vegetables in. I reuse the same potting soil for years. I always try to add some compost or black cow cow manure to the pot. You always have to, um, potting soil will settle over time. So if you have a large pot, you grew, let's say, a tomato in it. The tomato does its thing. It grows. You get lots of tomatoes. That's great. Pull the tomato out. Before you plant something else in it, you need to really fluff that soil up because it's probably gotten compacted a little bit. Throw a couple handfuls of black cow cow manure in or homemade uh, compost, fluff it up, mix it in, you're good to go for the next planting. And Lee, down in Broward County, also has a lot of earth box planters that she grows her tomatoes in. They, like I said, they work just great. Um, Alicia says, should we be worried about mold inside plastic containers? I found mold in my container when I emptied to amend soil. Not so much when things are growing in them. When, when, if, you, if you purchase pots, you sh they should be really clean when you buy them. If you inherit or you reuse pots like I do, I have a huge empty pot collection. People donate them. They drop them off here at the office. You really, before you use them, you want to clean them and sterilize them. So clean them out really well. Sterilize with um, like 10% bleach solution, or I just use the um, bleach cleaner spray, 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 hose it out really, really well. Disinfected, no bacteria, no fungi. Fill it with soil, grow your plants before you swap out and put other plants in. If you dump all the soil out, and there's mold inside there, just clean it again. That type of mold is not the general, generally the same species as what attacks and kills your plants. So it may not be good in general. It generally does look nasty, but don't worry that you're growing mold and bacteria and fungi that are killing your plants. Because usually the stuff that looks unattractive and grows on a pot is different from what is in the soil and attacks your plants' roots and kills them. Different species. Deborah, thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna try to do more of these things on Mondays. I think Monday's gonna kind of be our free for all day. I'll do something, just gonna kind of change every week. Um, and we have, we'll take, well, I'll answer one last question here. Anita asks, above, I asked about keeping rats out. Any recommendations? 
depends on it depends depends on a lot of things if you're growing an in-ground garden in your backyard chances are you have rats i have rats it's nothing personal guys we all have rats we all have rats somewhere in our neighborhood hopefully we have very few rats and they're not a problem with breaking into the our attic or overrunning our backyard shed or something like that but rats are part of the natural environment outside lots of things like rats because they like to eat them all the red shoulder and red tailed hawks i have in my neighborhood all the snakes help to eat rats so the goal is to minimize the number of rats because nobody wants too many um keeping things can rats are a tough one because if you put up any kind of fence rats can scale a lot if you have a rat problem go and get rat traps don't get the old-fashioned ones that your your grandparents used and broke their fingers where you take the metal bend it back and the slightest bump and it snaps and tries to break your finger those things are scary i won't get anywhere near that they have the new um there's a name for them um they're plastic so it's a rat trap and you take off a little cap and you put some peanut butter in there and then you squeeze it and it click it stays open set the trap down put it in a place where pets and squirrels and other non-target things are going to get to it and try trapping your rats don't put poisons outside it will kill birds of prey and owls and we none of us wants to do that hopefully so the new rat traps work really really well if you have a raised bed if that's what you're talking about a raised bed garden first you have to make sure that your problem is really rats and you may even need to put a trail cam out there because we have rats we have mice we have voles which are little looks like a mole but they generally don't tunnel underground like moles do we have moles also we have um possums we have raccoons we have a multitude of and we have squirrels squirrels love to dig in gardens so we have all kinds of stuff out there very important you need to know who your problem is but honestly for rats rat traps are going to work the best Oh, rats love eating your wheatgrass. Yeah, trap them and and reduce the number of them. Whether you can ever get to zero and keep it at zero, I don't know. But traps will help the population stay down low and under control. The problem is when we go out there and we kill snakes on our property, they overdevelop your neighborhood. Now you don't have birds to prey. Mice and rats have nothing eating them. If you give them a place to make homes and a food source and water source, their populations are going to go through the roof. So traps help to keep the population down. I have had problems with just a few too many in my backyard. That's how I know about those traps and how easy they are to use. But I don't have to set them very often. So, hey, guys, thank you so much um, for all the comments and all the questions. Let me go ahead and pop, put my email up here one last time. If anybody has any follow-up questions, just shoot me an email. But, hey, look at this. It's lunchtime. So let's go ahead and wrap it up for today. Like I said, we're going to try to be back on here doing something or sharing something every Monday especially during spring. This is prime gardening season. Everybody's thinking about getting outside and planting something now. So we're going to try to put a variety of things out here on Monday. I'll get with Teresa and we'll come up with some great ideas. But until then, please be sure to tune in this coming Thursday at 10 a.m. back here on our Facebook page, same place. And we have the weekly virtual plant clinic. And that is the place to ask your questions and share your pictures. And I'll make Lily answer all the really, really hard questions. So tune in on Thursday for that. And other than that, everybody have a great day. 
and we'll see you again really soon.